Hi, I'm David Mueller, retired hydrologist from the U.S. Geological Survey and founder of Genesis Hydrotech. In today's video, I would like to convince you why you should be using QREV INT to process your ADCP stream flow measurements. I'd like to begin with a bit of history uh, of how this came into being, then talk about consistency, or perhaps the lack thereof, and then talk about how QREV uses the best available data to give you the best possible discharge from your measurement. And finally, give you a quick peek at the QREV INT user interface. It began in 2005, as a user of Wind River, Wind River 2, there are thresholds that you can set to screen out invalid data. However, those thresholds had to be set manually. And I envisioned, based on what I knew about those thresholds and about the way that the data were collected and should look, that we could use statistical properties to automatically set those thresholds and filter out invalid data. Likewise, we often see spikes in our depth data. And again, it would seem logical that we could use a statistical procedure to mark out those invalid depths automatically. So I developed this demonstration project in MATLAB, shared it with the manufacturers, and unfortunately, over time, they apparently didn't have enough interest to implement it into their software. In 2007, after the introduction of the StreamPro ADCP, which had no compass by default, we observed that there is a false upstream movement when making a stationary moving bed test with a StreamPro, particularly if it's off the end of a tether and it is allowed to swim back and forth at the end of the tether. This motion of going back and forth with no compass results in a false upstream moving bed. So we created SMBA, a software to process the stationary moving bed test, and it uses the dot product to compute an upstream movement in the absence of a compass. It compensates for the sideways boat motion, and actually then, if there is a moving bed, will apply a correction and give you a corrected discharge. Likewise, following on to that, we created LC, which is software to process a loop moving bed test. And this software provided some automated quality checks on the loop, like looking at the percent of invalid bottom track data and the consistency of the compass. And just like SMBA, if there was a moving bed, it would automatically compute a corrected discharge. In 2010, after some discussion in an after-class discussion in a training class in Oslo, Norway, it was determined that we could actually compress the entire cross-section velocity profile onto a single plot by using the normalized distance from the stream bed and the normalized unit Q for every cell and every ensemble in the measurement. This was further expanded and eventually the extract program was created. And the extract program then also uses statistical parameters as well as some empirical logic to automatically select a preferred extrapolation fit for the data. In addition, at the bottom right of the screen that you see here, there is an average discharge sensitivity analysis. So you can see how important picking the extrapolation really is to your final discharge. In 2013, the Office of Surface Water approved the development of QREV. This allowed us to combine the automated screening demonstration project, SMBA, LC, and Extrap into a single code. It also allowed us to improve the consistency and efficiency in processing moving boat ADC stream flow measurements, and would serve as a validation of whatever the manufacturers were doing in their software. In 2017, we realized that we were beginning to hit the limitations of the MATLAB uh, development 
and decided to port QREV to Python. This would allow us to maintain and improve the previously coded methods and functionality. It would eliminate the need for a large MATLAB library. It would move us to an open source language and remove the dependency we had on proprietary software. This would also allow us to modernize and improve the user interface and allow for additional features. In addition, we could improve the speed of opening and processing the measurement. So what is the difference between QREV and QREV int? Well, in 2019, I retired from the US Geological Survey, although under a special contract, they brought me back on a half-time basis for two years to continue to develop QREV in Python. When that appointment expired, I was approached by several international water agencies to continue development on QREV. But because I was no longer part of the USGS, I could no longer speak and code QREV. QREV is an open source software, so I created a fork of the repository and called it QREV Int for QREV International. I then was able to continue to do development, and all of that development was shared back with the USGS. And as of today, I work very closely with the USGS to keep a common code base with agency-specific configurable options. So the code in QREV, our QREV int, is essentially the same code, but there are some different options available in the international version. Also, being separate from a government agency allows me to move a little faster and avoid some of the bureaucracy and allows enhancements and bug fixes to be released to the public in a little bit faster manner. So I mentioned consistency, and you would think that you want consistency in computations if you had the same data and you could process it both in TRDI's Wind River 2 software and Sontex River Surveyor Live software, you would expect that you should get the same discharge. However, when we look at the methods used by both pieces of software, we see a lot of differences, as these are shown in this table. And a couple of the major ones that I see is if you have invalid data. And what happens if you have invalid data? Well, Sontec, at least the M9 S5 at the time, used the narrow band processing for most of their data collection and they had no screening of water track data. TRDI did screen their water track data because they were using a broadband approach. And if the water track data was invalid, they would simply increase the time between ensembles. So they would mark the entire ensemble invalid, and then the next valid ensemble would have a longer duration and essentially backfill that data. If the bottom track was invalid, again, TRDI would mark the entire ensemble invalid, increase delta T, and backfill. However, in that same situation, Sontec would hold the last valid bottom track value for up to nine samples, and then at the end of nine samples, they would set that boat velocity to zero. If the boat velocity was computed with GPS, TRDI, instead of increasing DT as they had for water track and bottom track, they would hold the last valid GPS velocity until the next valid GPS velocity was obtained. Conversely, Sontec were with bottom track, they were holding the last valid. If it was from GPS, they would increase delta T. So you can see that neither manufacturer was consistent with their own software. And in fact, they did almost the exact opposite of what the other manufacturer did in the same situation. So the idea with QREV int was to provide a consistent set of computational algorithms so that you would get the same discharge, no matter if you collected the data with a TRDI instrument or a Sontec instrument. With QREV, we wanted to build our data processing in a consistent and logical progression. So to begin, you'd look at your pre-measurement and you'd look at the quality assurance of those pre-measurement activities like the system test, the compass calibration, and the moving bed test. 
Then we'd look at the boat speed, both bottom track and our GPS. We would apply the automated filters that could be developed and filter out any questionable data. Where there were data that were invalid, we would use interpolation to fill those ensembles with invalid data so that when we left this processing step, we had a boat speed for every ensemble. We did the boat speed first so that when we would plot the depth, we would have an accurate representation of the cross-section shape. And then again, we would apply some statistical filters to identify invalid depths. We would remove those invalid depths and replace it with interpolated depths. To process water velocity, we needed both depth so that we knew which depth cells were valid, and we needed boat speed to compensate for the speed of the boat and get the true water velocity. Again, we apply automatic filters based on st some statistical properties, mark data invalid, and where the data are marked invalid, we interpolate from the nearby valid data. The result is now we have water velocity, depth, and boat speed, everything we need for discharge to compute in every ensemble and for the entire cross-section. So the progression built from the bottom up. Likewise, when we designed the QREV interface, the processing works from left to right. Now I would like to show you an example of how the different algorithms can make a substantial difference in the final discharge, particularly in the presence of invalid data. The data you're looking at on this screen was collected during the flood. It was collected from a tethered boat off the downstream side of a bridge. If you remember the table that we looked at previously, RDI, if there isn't valid navigation, depth, and water track data, they mark the entire ensemble invalid and then backfill. So in this case, you can see that the depth was invalid. Consequently, the ensemble was marked invalid and the data were backfilled. One of the things you observe with the backfilling of the data is that depending on the direction, whether they're moving left to right or right to left, this section gets a substantially different depth. And all of the invalid data pretty much gets filled in with high velocity data that were collected between the two invalid locations. The result of this was a discharge of 112,400 cubic feet per second. That discharge was substantially greater than the historical rating. So it was relayed to the National Weather Service who revised their flood forecast. As a result of that revision to the flood forecast, a local levy board decided that they should breach one of their levees because it was going to be overtopped. Now, if we look at processing that data with QREV and the algorithms we use in QREV, we see something totally different. In the locations where there were invalid data when processed in Wind River, we actually see that there's valid data. Because where depth was invalid, QREV interpolated depth between the valid data. The result was we had water track data that could be used. When I first saw this and I saw that the data were extremely different than the neighboring valid data, my first thought was, well, we did this work, but it really didn't pay off. However, after talking with the technician that collected the data, what I found out was is that the two locations within valid data were the locations of two bridge piers. And the pier on the right actually had a large debris pile collected on the nose of the pier. So the resulting measurement on the downstream side of the bridge was actually measuring the wake vortices from behind the pier and the debris pile and there was effectively no downstream movement in that turbulence and wake vortices. So the data that we collected was in fact correct and the result discharge from QREV was 95,000 cubic feet per second, which actually was very close to the historical rating. Had this discharge been calculated with QREV, which was not available at the time, the 95,000 
would have been reported to the Weather Service. It would have been consistent with their current flood forecast. No revision would have been made, and the local levy board would not have chosen to breach their levy. So there can be significant consequences to the algorithms we use to process our discharge data measured with an ADCP. And not just to pick on TDR, TRDI, I'll give you one example um, from Sontec, and this one involves invalid bottom track velocity. If composite tracks are turned off in River Survey or Live, then, and there is invalid bottom track, then as we mentioned when we were looking at that table, valid bottom track velocity is maintained for up to nine ensembles. After the nine ensembles, then it's set to zero. The result of that is if we look at some sample data and we look at this set of samples, we see we have a 0 0.765 that's valid and we get a discharge. We have a 0 0.702 meters per second that's valid and we get a discharge. And then we have invalid data. So we hold a constant 0 0.702 for up to nine samples. We compute discharge after the ninth sample it gets set to zero. When it gets set to zero, you'll notice the discharge does not increase. So we've actually biased our measurement low because we have not computed discharge while the boat was moving over that portion of the channel. And it's not until we again get valid data that discharge again is being computed. Unfortunately, if we look at the color contour plot in River Surveyor Live, there is absolutely no indication that we've missed measuring the discharge in part of the cross section. The only way to know that there's a potential problem would be to plot the bottom track reference codes. And we see here when it goes to zero, that means invalid data. We would then have to look and see if that's longer than nine samples, and then we'd know that we were missing some discharge and our measurement was biased low. Finally, I'd like to give you a sneak peek at the user interface for QREV. Um, as you see, the most obvious thing is there's a lot of going on on the front page, but on the front page, you can essentially see everything you need to know about the measurement, at least initially. You see color coding, much like a, a traffic light. If it's red, that's a warning. That means it failed some significant and critical filters and quality assurance thresholds. If it's orange or yellow, that means it failed some, but you probably ought to take a look, but it's probably okay. If it's green, it means it passed all our quality checks. If it's blue, that means that the user went in and changed one of the automated settings. So that as a reviewer, you could open this measurement, look at this screen, and see immediately if the user changed something. In the bottom left are messages for the warnings and cautions, so you can see why those occurred uh, even before you click on the tab and look at the specific dialog for that particular parameter. If you click on any of the rows in the table at the left, it will show the color contour plot and the ship track plot for that transect. Near the bottom, we have a transect discharge series. The horizontal lines you see there represent each of the transects and the mean discharge computed for that transect. This gives you an idea of the variability of the discharge between the transects. In the lower right, we have the extrapolation plot. And this lets you evaluate how closely you would agree with the automated selection of the extrapolation methods. It also would show you that you have picked a different extrapolation method from that that is automated. In this case, that's difficult to see because the selected and the automated were one and the same. But if they were different, you would see two separate lines. This gives the user a, an idea, do I need to click on the extract tab and get into more detail, or is this a pretty, pretty good fit and I agree with it and I can move on. Above the extrapolation plot is an uncertainty plot, and this plot allows the user to see what part of their discharge caused the most uncertainty 
in the final discharge.